a bizarre sighting in the middle of the woods. A conspiracy that involves America's favorite pastime. And then we take another trip to the conspiracy theory iceberg to look at the bizarre theory that demonic activity is closely connected to the blue light coming out of your cell phone. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day too. We got a lot of stuff to cover. We got three stories. First off, I want to give a shout out to our newest Patreon, Swain on Discord. Swain on Discord, thank you so much for supporting the show. Really, really helps out a lot. I want to say this about Swain real quick. There's going to be a link in the show notes. Today I'm putting it above even my Patreon link. I want everyone to check this out. A long time ago, Swain took my Thomas Dick episode and made a proof of concept little animation of that episode. It's maybe like 40 seconds, a minute long. I, dude, I think it's so funny. Actually watching this video, watching this cartoon, made me realize how my style of presenting it, it was really kind of a wake-up call. It was kind of weird to see myself doing the show because this was pretty early on i think this was in the first hundred episodes it was really really cool i'd been meaning to share it with you and then i forgot who sent it to me honestly and and then i've lost the link but when he he hit me up on the patreon i was able to track it down so there it is i i recommend all you guys checking out his channel checking out that video it's super funny it's a little animated version of that episode awesome thank you so much swain thank you so much for doing that if you can't support the patreon that's fine too just help get the word out about the show that really Really helps out a lot, guys. Swain, we're going to toss you the keys to the Jason Jalopy. First off, we're headed out to the middle of the forest. We're getting married, apparently. What's that song from? Some old-timey thing? Doesn't matter. Music box music. We get to the middle of the forest. Now, this is totally unsourced. This was a post from the X board. That was screenshotted and then presented on Reddit. So that's the providence of this story. Or providence? Providence? It doesn't matter. Providence. This is the providence of this story. We don't have a source. We don't have a location. We don't have anything like that. But I still find the story interesting. We're going to take a look. Okay, so slow down the car, Swain. We're pulling up in the forest. Get out. We got on our hunting caps. We got our rifles. We're walking around. And we're going to join a man hunting with his grandfather. What happened was there was a kid. He was was his 19th birthday. He was out hunting with his grandpa. A little father, not father-son bonding activity, grandfather-son bonding activity. No, they're not. Whatever. Two dudes are hanging out in the woods, right? And they see a deer walking, walking around. And this is what they came here for. This isn't that Rihanna song. (laughs) This is what they actually came here for. They're going to kill this deer. And the deer stops and looks at a rock. And they get their guns ready. Do both of them shoot at the same time? I've never been hunting. Do you take turns hunting? Like, do I have it? And I'm like, okay, I'm going to shoot it in the neck this time. And you're like, no, you numbskool, I'm going to do it. You guys are wrestling over the gun. If there's two people with guns and they take turns, do they both shoot at the same time? Whichever bullet hits it first wins. Anyways, they're sitting there with their guns. This is, I'm a city boy. They're sitting there with their guns. And they see this deer. And the deer is like just standing there looking at this rock. And then (laughs) slams its head into the rock. And the grandpa and the son... The son's not there. The grandpa, the son realizes the disturbance. The grandfather and the grandson look at each other, and they look back at the deer, and this the rock is covered in blood, and the deer looks at the rock, <gasps> smashes its head into the rock again, <laughs> smashes its head into the rock again. One of the antlers break off. It's like 3D. It's coming right at the grandpa and the grandson. Whoa, they dodge. <laughs> crash, 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 smashing its head into the rock harder and harder and harder. The deer rears its head back up and brains are shooting out of the deer. Swain's thrown up in the corner. Sorry, Swain. I'm holding his hair back. Smash! Smash! The deer keeps smashing its head into the rock. Brains are just leaking out. And then the deer stands up on two legs. Looks around. Starts walking towards the river on two legs. And then just doot, doot, doot. Raging river. Doot, doot. Dude, walking deeper into the water, dude, drowns. The grandpa and the grandson, (laughs) birthday party's canceled, right? Grandfather actually moved out of the area. He went to go live with his grandmother in Florida. Not his grandmother. (laughs) She would be like Betsy Ross. 
He goes to live with his wife in Florida. I don't know where they separated before. He's like, honey, please take me back. I've seen the error of my ways. Plus, I've seen pure Cthulhu-level horror. Please, I want another chance. He moves in with his ex-wife, his grandma. Not his grandma. What is up with you? Anyways, the point is, is that grandfather moves away. And the son, the grandson, never went back to the forest. So, that story was posted. It's creepy, right? It's pretty disgusting. Uh, some people have had... First off, let's assume the story's true. Could totally be fake. Could be creepy creepypasta. But let's assume for the sake of argument that's true. Some people on Reddit goes, it could be chronic wasting disease. It could have had, like, Kruschfeld's Jakob disease. It's that mad cow disease, but it's the deer version. Mad deer disease. It could have been that they had, like, a like some sort of, obviously, mental deficiency and smashed their brains. It could be that they were having some sort of disease that was eating away at their brain. And the itch was so bad that you were smashing their head into the rock. Doesn't explain why they walked up on two feet. I guess deer sometimes can walk on two feet. Not for a super long distance, but they, they have been known to do that. There's video footage of them walking like that. But, um, yeah, a bizarre story. I mean, obviously, I'm covering it not just because it's bizarre, but because it's almost like... It is like a Cthulhu-level thing. Like an animal killing itself very calmly. Like it was smashing its head, but it wasn't crying out in pain. And then once... It had already knocked out a, a good chunk of its brains. It stood up and walked away into the river. Now, that obviously sounds fake. Another person on Reddit was saying they worked at a farm. Oh, by the way, if you love animals, <laughs> rewind it. Don't listen to this first story. But, sorry, I should have said that earlier. This one guy said he was working on a farm in Australia, and there was a massive wildfire. And he remembers seeing kangaroos that had been caught on fire running Towards their fence line, they had a metal fence line around their property. And he says the, the kangaroos were burning. They were on fire. They are killing themselves. They began smashing their heads into the metal fence line to um, kill. The pain was so unbearable. Which would, is interesting because I didn't know animals were that smart. Like, I didn't think an animal was smart enough to kill itself. Like, yeah, sure, lemmings. You know, that's not true. You know, lemmings don't really run off cliffs. That, that's a weird thing. Walt Disney's... That was from a documentary that Walt Disney made, and they're like, I don't know if they just needed a climatic ending or something like that. I guess the lemmings kind of do that, but they, the producers of that documentary pushed them off. They weren't like, it wasn't like off screen. There was a intern like throwing them off the cliff, but they edited the footage and made basically like herded them off the cliff. I think it is a real thing, but not to the scale that it really is. And then that movie was a meme, made it a thing. But anyways... Like, how does a kangaroo, so you're on fire, this is super grim, but let's say I'm a kangaroo and I'm smoldering. Not like I'm super sexy, I'm literally smoky. And I see a pillow, a metal stake, and a tree. And I have to smash my head into one of those three things. I didn't think animals were smart enough to go, pillow, I'll just take a nap. The metal stake will go through my brain. And that tree will take a long time for me to smash my head. Because they don't know what metal is. I didn't know that animals knew the difference between, like, minerals and stuff. Like, I didn't know, like, if you put a kangaroo and you had, like, let's say you had a cliff. You were like, Jason, please, please, just stop talking about it. You had a cliff. And there was, like, a bunch of water at the bottom of one cliff. And then a bunch of water and some jagged rocks on another cliff. Swain's like, give me my money back. Why am I here for this episode? He's, he's erasing the cartoon. He deletes it from YouTube. You have a cliff. You have a water. You have a cliff. You have water with jagged rocks. And then you have a cliff with, like, a pavement underneath it. Would the kangaroo go to the first cliff and go, mm -mm -mm, that's just water. I'll probably swim. But it will put the fire out. And then he jumps to the other one, but he still wants to kill himself because he owes the mob a bunch of money and he, he, he can't pay him back and he's on fire. So he goes to the other cliff and he sees the jagged rocks and he goes, hmm, that will kill me, but maybe not. Maybe I'll fall in between the jagged rocks and die very slowly. And then he goes to the other cliff and sees the pavement and goes, that is pavement. I, in my kangaroo brain, knows that that will kill me instantly because the reason I know that if I jump off a cliff and if I land on pavement, I will die is because people have told me that. I don't genetically know. I never genetically knew that. You didn't know that. We don't know that if you fall off a distance, you die. Unless somebody tells you or you see it happen. If I uh, Kangaroos aren't walking around with watermelons and they don't butterfingers it. And they're like, whoops. And they watch the watermelon splat on the ground and the kangaroo goes, that will happen to me if, if I fall. That's not how animals think, right? So how did the animals know? How did, why wasn't the deer smashing his head on a tree? How did he know a rock was going to do the job? 
Like, how did they figure that out? So, anyways, the kangaroos impale themselves on metal spikes, which to me makes me think that they know minerals and stuff. Because then they'd be like, that's like soft soap rock. What's that rock that's like pumice? The kangaroo's on fire. He sees a bunch of pumice. You guys get it. I'm not going to keep naming. I'm not going to keep coming with hypothetical situations. How does the kangaroo know that the metal would do it? Like, did they jump past another fence and it was just like wood and the kangaroos are like, sure, I'm burning to death, but that won't do the job. I know another 50 feet there's a metal fence line. So there you go. I did not intend for that to be (laughs) another evolutionary rant, but it turned out to be one. Swain, let's go ahead and leave behind Australia. That's where we ended up in that story. Let's hop in the carpenter copter. We're headed back to America. This is a really short one. I've had this on deck for a while. That was very interesting because I talk a lot about real conspiracies, conspiracies that are provable, that matter. And this conspiracy, you can argue whether or not it matters. I think it matters to a large group of people, though. And I got to give a shout out to Chris Thompson for Deadspin, the website Deadspin. He wrote this article a while back back in uh, July of 2019, and all of my research comes from this article. To give you a little background of the story, you have Major League Baseball, MLB, recently, back in 2019, had purchased Rawlings, and they're the ones who make the baseballs that are used in professional-level baseball games. So originally they are two separate companies, but now Major League Baseball bought out Rawlings. And then we have this quote from Houston Astros pitcher Justin Verlander. He was speaking to ESPN And he had this quote, and he's going to be referencing a man named Rob Manfred. He's the Major League Baseball commissioner. So that's a little bit of background to this. I think this is an interesting conspiracy. And so what Verlander's beef is, is he believes that Major League Baseball is messing with the baseballs themselves. Because now they own the company that manufactures the baseball. He believes that Major League Baseball is actually goosing up the balls. They're making it so... They can just hit homer after homer after homer. Look at this quote. I found this interesting. It's an effing joke, Verlander says. It's an effing joke. Major League Baseball is turning this game into a joke. They own Rawlings. And you've got Manfred up here saying it might be the way they center the pill. Some baseball term. I don't know what that means. But you might. Back to the quote. They own the effing company. If any other 40 billion company bought out a 400 million company and the product changed dramatically, it's not a guess as to what happened. We all know what happened. Manfred, the first time he came in, what did he say? He said they want more offense. All of a sudden he comes in, the balls are juiced? It's not a coincidence. We are not idiots. Then they ask him, do you think that this is intentional? Do you think that these balls are making it easier to hit home runs? He goes into this quote, yes, 100%. They've been using juice balls in the home run derby forever. They know how to do it. It's not coincidence. I find it really hard to believe that Major League Baseball owns Rawlings, and just coincidentally, the balls become juiced. Manfred had a response to this, and he simply said, the balls had not been changed in, quote, any meaningful way, unquote. So the balls have been changed. I think that's an interesting conspiracy theory. It's one that affects millions of people, baseball fans. It definitely also affects money. So it's an interesting conspiracy theory. It's one that is probably true, right? It's one that involves a corporation manipulating the outcome behind the scenes. It really has all the hallmarks of a conspiracy theory. You have a truth sayer who's putting his his career on the line. I'm sure that he got, I'm sure his coaches got several phone calls after this interview. I'm sure he got pulled into his coach's office and all this stuff. It's all the hallmarks of a conspiracy theory. I find this type of stuff very fascinating. It's a reminder that there are conspiracy theories happening all around us. They're like miracles. They happen all around, and we don't know how they work, but they happen. Very, very fascinating story. I don't really cover many sports on this show, but I thought that was an interesting one. So, Swain, let's hop in that carpenter copter one last time this episode. We're headed out to Britain to start this adventure. We're flying out of Houston, Texas. Supposedly, we'll cover this in a later episode, but supposedly there's supposed to be a massive hurricane hitting Houston, Texas on August 10th, I think it was. We'll be covering that. It's possible that a time traveler is using TikTok to warn people of the future. However, he's also selling t-shirts, so I'm a little skeptical of his time travel claims. But Beatrice Leva sent me that story. We'll be talking about that later in the week. That's a little teaser for that. We're leaving behind. Beatrice is like, no, no, the hurricane's coming. Save me, save me. What? We can't hear you over the carpenter copter. We can totally hear her. We're just leaving her behind. Wait, no, I'm a loyal listener. We're flying away. So 
she's a loyal listener, but we're still leaving her to the to the hurricane. That won't happen. But we're flying out. We're flying out to Britain. So this is from the conspiracy theory iceberg. It's just a simple phrase on the conspiracy theory iceberg. And again, thank you, some weirdo from Twitter, aka Jack, for making this conspiracy theory iceberg spreadsheet. It's really made a lot of this stuff helpful to look at. We're flying to Britain because there's a conspiracy theory iceberg phrase. LED attracts demons, and that means light-emitting diodes. So we're talking about all sorts of LED lights, which includes flat-screen television sets, which will include your cell phone, includes computer monitors, which includes devices all over us. These things invite demonic activity. So before we get into this, we're going to go to Britain. We're going to travel back to the year 1907. And, and LED light has an interesting provenance. Of different things. I see, I learn, I learn, I learn from my mistakes. Um, when it was basically invented and then forgotten and invented and forgotten. But it was originally first invented in the year 1907. That's the first time they were able to create a solid state light. Which is different than gas light or filament lights. Now, back in 1907, this is like people are still walking around in old-timey Victorian clothing. The tripods haven't even shown up yet. So we're talking about like old-timey stuff, but they were still working on a solid-state light. And now it's everywhere. But, you know, like it was invented and lost, invented and lost. 1907, guess who invented it? Marconi Labs. Now, I don't know if that's the same Marconi related to Marconi Systems that we covered on Friday, that a bunch of people were brutally suicided. A little, a little weird coincidence, right? I don't know how many Marconi labs are out there, but maybe it's different. Maybe it's the same people. It wouldn't make sense, though, because Marconi was pushing the limits of science even in the 80s. But LED lights are all around us. It's very, very efficient. They don't use a lot of energy. They don't put out a lot of heat. The problem is, is that they're very, very damaging to our eyes. But it, it, it allows us to have flat screens. It allows us to have super bright cell phones and all that stuff. So pick your poison. It could cause permanent eye damage. We don't know yet. But let's take a look at this phrase here. LED attracts demons. LED attracts demonic activity. It's kind of a spooky phrase because I know that I personally stay up late in bed with my cell phone reading nonsense. And the light is comforting, right? You're in a dark room. You have that light. You feel safe. But what if the light is actually attracting the darkness? What if right now while you're lying in bed listening to this podcast and your phone's off in the corner giving you a little bit of blue light? What if that's not a safety net? What if it's actually a beacon for dark forces? I think it's interesting on one level because light is always, light is the opposite of darkness. The book of Genesis starts off where there is nothing but darkness. And then God says, let there be light. And that's like the creation. There was nothingness, and then light is the first thing created. That's if you believe in the story of Genesis. But even if you don't, I think you still get the symbolism. Even if you look at the book of Genesis as a myth, you still understand the symbolism. It's light coming into darkness. It's something coming into nothing. I think when we think of light, we also think of the heat, of the warmth. And even a light bulb, an old light bulb, an old filament light bulb, was hot to the touch, so you couldn't have light without other forms of energy, i.e. heat. But what if you're able to have light, but you're able to not have the heat, which is what a LED does, or it has such an insignificant amount of heat? What if it's not the light that actually keeps the darkness away, but the heat that does? It's not the light of day that keeps demonic forces at bay. It's the heat of the life-giving sun. It's the oil lamp. It's the candle. It's the flame. Even if it's just the flame being put out by a filament. We were confused. It wasn't the light itself, but the heat behind the light. Now that we've been able to create a world of light with no heat, we've basically taken that natural defense away. So we are in the darkness, even though there's light. We're still surrounded by darkness. So when you're already in a dark room and you pull out your cell phone late at night, that blue screen pops up. Something knows that you are not protected. It knows where you're at. And it knows that the heat, the life-giving energy, is gone. Replaced with a false light. Lucifer is described as, Lucifer literally means light bringer. 
But is it a false light? That was always the thing. Lucifer brings false light. Very, very esoteric. I mean, obviously, this is what we do with the conspiracy theory icebergs. We take these phrases. We examine whether or not there's any truth to the phrase. We put on our conspiracy caps full board and discuss this. So that's one saying of it could have a literal meaning like that. That having LED lights attract demons because it's, it is a false light. We think we're safe, but we're not. We're the opposite of safe. We're sending out a beacon. I mean, that's always a thing. When you cry for out for help, you could be attracting a savior or you could be attracting a predator knowing that you're unsafe. You're scared. So let's flip this around for a second. Maybe the blue screen isn't attracting them to us in the external world. Maybe the demons have already infested cyberspace. They're already existing in this virtual world. And when we pull out our phone late at night, turn it on and begin surfing the internet, as you kids call it, they find their way from the virtual world into our world. That's an interesting, interesting theory. Let's take a look at this. There is a re- You'll see this if you look this up. So I have to address, I have to address this. There's a man, he's the Reverend Jim Pees. I have to give him his due. He's a man of the cloth. A Reverend Jim Peesborough, he wrote a book called Devil in the Machine. He's a minister down in Georgia, and he was interviewed in this newspaper. You'll see his name pop up on a ton of very reputable paranormal websites. He wrote a book called Ghosts in the Machine about how demons can possess computers. He doesn't exist. He was originally mentioned in the Weekly World News. The book doesn't exist. He doesn't exist. So if you start researching this and he pops up, immediately just... Move on to the next article, because that doesn't exist. What does exist, so I had to address that, because he's most popular. What does exist, though, is there is a man named Rizwan Horshi, and he wrote two books. They're both called See and Control Demons and Pains, From My Eyes, Sense and Theories. And then he had book one and book two. He had an interesting, th- I, I'm, I haven't ordered the books. I was just reading the excerpts, and um, you know they have like the Google X-ray thing. But I think I got the gist of it. He has this theory that demons do possess computers he actually believes that there is a separate type of demon that is what's known as an electronic demon and he says their brain they're basically completely digital but not digital in the sense that there are ones and zeros like they don't exist they exist in an electronic form their bodies are electric their brains are electric they are completely different strata of demons And these demons use the electrical impulses of our brains to hack us. Now, this obviously sounds completely bizarre, right? But let's again put on our conspiracy caps that also protect our brains from being hacked. The idea of a spiritual possession is a demon taking over your body. Your soul is trapped in your own body. So you can kind of observe what's going on, but the demon has control over your body. If you had to explain hacking to a caveman, that is pretty much what you would say, right? That your computer is being controlled by somebody else. Now, obviously, it gets more complicated than that. You could say, well, it's not your computer is not controlled. It's this particular subset program that's running, and it's overriding this program that should be doing it, and so on and so forth. It has back to, You can go into the real technical side of it, but you will just say, the hacker has control of your computer. You're talking to a computer specialist, they'll be like, well, they have control of this particular thing and this pathway and stuff like that. So the idea of the of a demon not necessarily having a soul possession, but simply hacking into your brain. Your brain is nothing but electrical impulses and gray matter. And so the idea that something could interfere with the electrical impulses would make sense. And how do most people get hacked? Not all, but most people get hacked by messing up themselves, by inviting something into their computer. Opening an email, clicking on a link, winning, quote-unquote, winning a sweepstakes and following the prompts. That's how a lot of computers get hacked. It's rare that you just turn on your computer. If it's possible, I'm sure it's possible, but you would have to, it would have to be a specialized attack where you turn on your computer, you do nothing, and it gets hacked. And so what do we always hear about people getting possessed? They invite the spirits in. They're using the Ouija board. They're going to these haunted locations. They're putting themselves at risk of being possessed, i.e. hacked. So it's less paranormal and more like a new program overriding the brain. And because these demons exist in an electronic form or an electrical form, they can move through the internet. So it's not like you're pulling your cell phone up late at night and there's a demon out in a graveyard somewhere and <laughs> flying through the sky and it's sitting outside your window. 
it's the other side. You're it's in the system already, and you're going through the internet and you're seeing a link and you're clicking on it, and something in the system sees you. That blue light to us is a display, but it's really a one way mirror. On the other side of that screen of that big screen television set of your laptop of your phone, there's something watching you, influencing you, hacking you. I find this theory very, very fascinating. Very fascinating. I believe that there's another phrase on the conspiracy theory iceberg that I've tried looking into. I haven't really found much on it. It's enchanted websites. I believe, and I've mentioned this before on the show, I believe that websites can be haunted. I 100% believe that web, if, a, if a place, if a location can be haunted, what is a website but a digital place? We even use terms like digital storefront. Why couldn't there be haunted websites? Haunted porn websites that make you seek out more extreme pornography until the next thing you know, the feds are kicking in your door. You just went too far. You couldn't get that feeling again. It was addicted. A haunted gambling website. You end up blowing your family's fortunes. There was a guy recently who met a cam girl in Russia. He embezzled $250,000 from his father. And when his family finally had an intervention for him, he killed his brother, his mother, and his father. He's in prison now for the rest of his life for a cam girl. You, I'm not saying the cam girl is a demon, but I'm saying that you can't tell me there's not demonic influences on the internet. You find a gore website, and then you're trying to find even gorier things, and then you want to try it out for yourself. Now, millions of people could go and watch gore videos all day long, but you went to that site that had another force behind it. You went to that site, and something reached out and interfered with the electrical waves of your brain. You didn't even notice it, but you knew you needed to go back to that site. Maybe you were at work the next day, and you felt... I need to go see if they've updated that. I want to see what is new going on. I want to see this, and you keep going to it over and over and over again, and you're building those neural pathways. You're opening the door to this thing. Rizwan also says that, based on his theory, we should never build robots with the capability of killing humans, because guess what? These electronic demons can possess the body of a robot. So it may not be that we have to worry about the AI overlord, or maybe a demon will masquerade as an AI. Humanity will think they've created this amazing, advanced intelligence system, but it's really an age-old demonic force. The darkness itself that was pushed away when the light came into existence. Sitting in a computer. Leading humanity. And what does LED stand for? Light-emitting diode. What does it spell? Lead. Causing a person to move in a direction. Now, I've made fun of other people who've made such connections in the past, and feel free to make fun of me, but I do find that to be an interesting coincidence. Is it possible that these devices we have in our pockets that we use for entertainment, that you're probably listening to this podcast on this very moment, is actually a beacon? That brings us, every time we use it, one step closer to the darkness. We think it connects us as a civilization. And it does. But it may be connecting the civilization to something much darker, much older, and much more evil than we could ever comprehend. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be your email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. Twitter is at Dead Rabbit Radio. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day, but I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one, guys. Peace.